Now we are going to go to uh, page 9 in our syllabus, Lessons from the Jewish Harlot of Christ's Day. And I'm going to be adding some material to this particular presentation. Uh, I hope that this will illustrate the dangers of joining the iron with the clay, the danger of the church becoming a harlot by allying itself with the political powers, with the secular powers of the world. I'm going to begin by reading three statements from Ellen White that are not in your syllabus, so you might want to write down the reference. The first is Great Controversy, page 382. Great Controversy, 382. Very short statement, but very meaningful. It was by departure from the Lord, an alliance with the heathen, that the Jewish church became a harlot. How did the Jewish church become a harlot? By departing from the Lord, that's step number one, departing from the Lord, and then what? Alliance, alliance with the heathen, she became a harlot. And then she says this, and Rome, speaking about papal Rome, and Rome corrupting herself in like manner by seeking the support of worldly powers, when Ellen White uses the expression worldly powers, she's referring to the secular power, to the state. So she says, in like manner, by seeking the support of worldly powers, receives a like condemnation. So how did the Jewish church become a harlot? By linking up with the pagan nations. And she says, Rome, same thing, by linking up with the worldly powers, with the secular powers, also became a harlot. The second statement is in Great Controversy, page 568. Great Controversy, page 568. You might want to add that uh, to your syllabus. This is amazing. If you really want to do a study, uh, which will be very productive, is compare the Jewish church of Christ's day with the Roman Catholic papacy. It's amazing. Have you ever noticed that the papacy uses all of these vestments, and they have altars, and they light candles, and... You know, it's just like, just like transitioning from literal Israel to, to, to the Roman Catholic Church. All these ceremonies and, you know, the censor and all these things. You know, it's like, it's like the Jewish uh, religion continued in Roman Catholicism. This is what she says. There is a striking similarity between the Church of Rome and the Jewish Church at the time of Christ's first advent. Uh, what's she comparing? The Jewish church with the papacy. She continues saying, While the Jews secretly trampled upon every principle of the law of God, they were outwardly rigorous in the observance of its precepts, loading it down with exactions and traditions that made obedience painful and burdensome. Does the Roman Catholic Church add all kinds of traditions and maxims to the scriptures? Absolutely. Then she continues saying, As the Jews professed to revere the law, so do Romanists claim to reverence the cross. They exalt the symbol of Christ's sufferings, while in their lives they deny Him whom it represents. The third statement is in Great Controversy, page 443, where, once again, we're dealing with the iron and the clay. That's the central theme of every lecture that we're going to deal with in this class, the dangers of joining church and state. Whenever the church has obtained secular power, she has employed it to punish dissent from her doctrine. Protestant churches that have followed in the steps of Rome by forming alliance with worldly powers have manifested a similar desire to restrict liberty of conscience. And then she gives an example. The Church of England gives an example of this in the long continued persecution of dissenters. During the 16th and 17th centuries, Thousands of nonconformist ministers were forced to flee from their churches, and many, both of pastors and people, were subjected to fine, imprisonment, torture, and martyrdom. 
it was apostasy. Here comes the key portion. It was apostasy that led the early church to seek the aid of the civil government. And this prepared the way for the development of the papacy, the beast. Isn't that a significant statement? Last part again. It was apostasy that led the early church to seek the aid of the civil government. And this prepared the way for the development of the papacy, the beast. Now we want to ask the question, how did Jesus understand this issue of the relationship between the church and the state? If we know how Jesus believed on this particular issue, uh, we're going to know what God's plan is in the end time. By the way, you know, Dr. Teske was asking a question during the uh, intermission between this session and the last, and that is, you know, how do we know that uh, the system of the theocracy in the Old Testament is not the system that, that, uh, is the, that should be established today? Because that's what Protestants are saying today. Let's, if you read the book that was sent to you, you know, they're saying, you know, uh, this is the New Jerusalem, the, the, the United States, and this is the Promised Land. And, you know, we need to be like in the colonial period. We have to uh, have the, uh, the state enforce the, the decrees and the beliefs and the practices of the church. How do we know that the system now is not the same system uh, that, that we should have now is not the same system that existed in Israel? Well, we need to know how, what Christ thought about it, right? Now notice uh, what we find in Matthew 22, 15 to 21, the view of Christ on the relationship between church and state. We'll begin reading at verse 15. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true, and teach the way of God in truth, nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. In other words, you don't make a distinction between one person and another. They're hypocrites. They don't believe in anything they're saying. <laughs> but they're trying to butter him up. And they're trying to trick him. Verse 17. <coughs> Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness. He could see right through them. And said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? In other words, whose face is on this coin? and whose name is on it. They said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Do we have a duty towards Caesar? Towards the civil power? Yes. Do we have a duty towards God, towards the church? Yes. But Jesus understood these to be what? Separate. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God that which is God's. Let me ask you, financially, what do we all owe to God? Our tithe. And now let me ask a question that we don't feel comfortable with. Financially, what do we owe the government? <laughs> taxes, right? Now, would it be proper to take Caesar's taxes and give them to the church? No. no. Would it be proper to take uh, the church's money and give it to Caesar. No. Both kingdoms exist by will of God, but they are to exist, according to Jesus, separately. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's, and render to God what you owe to God. And now the big question is, what do we owe Caesar, and what do we owe God? What do we owe the government, and what do we owe God and His church? Well, let's talk for a few moments about the Ten Commandments, because that question is answered there in the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments describe our vertical relationship with God and our horizontal relationship with our fellow human beings. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 13. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 13. It says, So He declared to you His covenant, which He commanded you to perform, the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone. Now, could God have written the Ten Commandments on three tablets? 
could he have written all of them on one tablet? Yes. The question is, why did he write them on two tablets? Well, we all know the answer. Let's notice it in Scripture. Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5. The first four commandments describe our vertical relationship with God, what it means to love God and serve God. It says there in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. So our first duty is what? To love God with all of our being, basically is what it's saying. But is there also a horizontal responsibility that we owe our fellow human beings? Notice Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18. Leviticus, Leviticus 19 and verse 18. You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So we have a vertical relationship with God and we have a horizontal responsibility for our fellow human beings with whom we have fellowship on earth every day. Now Jesus put both of these commandments together. He said these are the two great commandments in the law of God. Notice Matthew 22 verses 34 through 40. Matthew 22 34 through 40. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. He's quoting Deuteronomy 6, right? Which we already read. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's Leviticus 19 verse 18. And then Jesus stated, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So the first four commandments describe our relationship with God. The last six describe our relationship with our fellow human beings. Now the first four commandments belong exclusively to God. The civil power can have nothing to do with the first four commandments. If I want to worship that screen there, I have a perfect right to do it. The civil power cannot do anything about it. That would be kind of ridiculous. But I can do it. Because it has to do with my relationship with God. And God's going to take care of it, some, not the civil power. If I want to worship an idol, can I worship an idol? Of course I can. The civil government can't say that I can or I can't. And now I'll say this, can the government punish people who blaspheme God's name? No, because it's God's name. Can the government uh, punish people for keeping the Sabbath or force them to keep Sunday? No, because the day of worship belongs to whom? To God. Now here's a very interesting point. The Lord Jesus was never accused of violating the civil laws of Rome. Do you know what the purpose of the civil laws is? It's to preserve the order of society. Let me ask you, does the civil power have a right to protect parents from abusive children? Does it? Of course it does. Does the government have a right to protect people's lives? Does the government have, a, a, have the duty of protecting marriage? It's not doing it. But does it have the duty of protecting marriage as between a man and a woman? Yes. There you have the seventh commandment. Does the government have a right to protect people's property and to protect people's reputation? Absolutely, because that preserves the civil order of society. So the civil power can have much to do with the second table of the law, but it can have nothing to do with what? With the first table of the law. Jesus was not accused of violating the civil laws of Rome. Jesus was never accused of abusing his parents. Jesus was never accused of killing anyone. Jesus was never accused of committing adultery. Jesus was never accused of being a thief or of lying to other human beings. No, he was never accused of those things. He never violated any civil law of Rome. He was an exemplary citizen, if you please. 
all of the accusations that were launched by the apostate church against Jesus had to do with the first table of the law. Let's give some examples. Jesus once said to a man, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> the Jewish leaders who were present went ballistic. They accused him of violating the first commandment when he said, your sins are forgiven. Notice Mark chapter 2 verse 7. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Were they accusing Jesus of violating the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me? Most certainly. Notice John chapter 10 and verse 33. Once again, Jesus is accused of violating the first commandment. The Jews answered him saying, because Jesus has just said, I and my Father are one. The Jews answered him saying, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you being a man, make yourself God. Are they accusing Jesus of violating the first commandment? Yes. You know they also accused Jesus of violating the third commandment. You remember Jesus once said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. To whom does the name I am belong? It belongs to God. Notice John 8, verses 58 and 59. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Oh, they knew what he was saying. They, then they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Did they accuse Jesus of violating the third commandment? Thou shalt have, uh, you not, not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain? Absolutely. Did they accuse Jesus of violating the fourth commandment? Absolutely. John 9, where he healed the blind man. Notice verse 16. Therefore some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. And when Jesus healed the paralytic, who had been paralyzed for 38 years, according to John 5, verses 16 and verse 18, uh, through verse 18, For this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him, because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, that is in their estimation, but also said that God was his father, making himself what? Making himself equal with God. So are you seeing the, the, the relationship here? Jesus, not accused of violating the civil laws of Rome, he was an exemplary citizen, but all the accusations that are launched at him have to do with his relationship with his father. They have to do with the first table of the law. Now, do you know what the Jews really wanted? Do you know what, what, uh, what they would have accepted if Jesus uh, had, uh, had become what they wanted? Do you know what they really wanted Jesus to become? They wanted Jesus to take over the reins of civil power. That's what they really wanted. That's the bottom line. If Jesus had been willing to proclaim himself a king, they would have accepted him, accepted him in an instant. A king to enforce their laws and to enforce their beliefs. They constantly showed that that was their desire. In fact, that was the devil's desire. Notice Matthew chapter 4 and verse 10. Again, the devil took him up, actually verse 8, Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. So what is the devil offering Jesus from the very beginning of his ministry? He's saying, take over the reins of civil power. He showed them their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. You don't have to go to the cross. You don't have to die. I'll just give all of this to you for free, is what the devil is saying. What did Jesus do? He said, no way. I didn't come to take over the reins of the civil power. You remember when Jesus fed the 5,000? The Bible says that they wanted to uh, take him uh, and make him king. Notice John chapter 6 and verse 15. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. The ringleader of this was Judas, by the way. Uh, he was the one that riled up the people to, to uh, try and get Jesus to become king. 
And you can tell that at the end of the chapter it says that Jesus says, Haven't I chosen you and one of you is the devil or is the devil? So we know that Judas was behind this whole idea. Uh, you know, the, the disciples, did they also have the same aspirations? Did they want Jesus to take over the reins of power and to, to enforce uh, the, the first table of the law and persecute everyone who didn't? Of course, you remember when Jesus was coming back to Jerusalem, his last journey to Jerusalem, and he wanted to go through some Samaritan villages. And uh, so he sent word ahead asking for permission. They said, no, we don't want you to come through our villages. Uh, well, the sons of thunder, James and John, uh, they showed what kind of Messiah they wanted Jesus to be. They said, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven and just incinerate those cities? Because they don't accept you and they don't accept your kingdom. See, what did they want? They wanted to enforce the, the, the kingdom of the Messiah by using the sword. Notice uh, Luke chapter 9, 55 and 56, what Jesus said. But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to what? But to save them. You see, what Jesus came was to implant His kingdom, the principle of His, of his kingdom in the human heart. It's like leaven. You know, do you get bread to rise by sprinkling a, sprinkling a little bit of, uh, of leaven on top of the dough? Of course not. You have to put the leaven inside and then the lump grows. And so it is when the Spirit of Christ is implanted in the church, the church grows. Jesus expressed in Luke 17, 20 and 21, the kind of kingdom that He came to represent. It was not to take the reins of civil power. That He will do when He comes again the second time. But the first time, Jesus explained in Luke 17, verse 20, now when He was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, what did they have in mind when they asked, when is the kingdom of God coming? They had in mind, when, is, when are you going to take the reins of civil power? That's right. He answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation. That means with an external display of power. Nor will they say, See here, or see there. See, there's the kingdom. And then he says, For indeed the kingdom of God is where? Within you. Let me ask you, when the principles of Christ's kingdom are in the heart, is society safe? How, how, do you, how do you make society safer? By building more prisons, right? By threatening people with the death penalty. No. How does society change? By implanting the principles of Christ's kingdom in the human heart. Then society changes. But, but the counterfeit of that is the church saying things are getting out of hand, and instead of preaching the implanting of Christ's kingdom in the heart, they say, let's get the help of the civil power to impose order on society. Are you understanding me? That's, what's, that's what the religious world is thinking today. Terrorism and immorality and gay marriage and all these things, things are getting out of hand. We need to enlist the civil power in order to impose the belief system of the church. I'm going to read you now a rather lengthy statement from Desire of Ages 509 and 510. This is not in your syllabus, I don't believe. Well, maybe it is. Yeah, it is in your syllabus. It's a lengthy statement, and, uh, and I don't like to read uh, very much because people get distracted, but you have the syllabus. Follow along because this is profound. The kingdom of God comes not with outward show, the gospel of the grace of God with its spirit of self-abnegation can never be in harmony with the spirit of the world. The two principles are antagonistic. The natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But today, what would she say today? But today in the religious world there are multitudes who as they believe, are working for the establishment of the kingdom of Christ as an earthly and temporal dominion. Did you read the book that we sent you? Was that, was that the idea that many of the uh, colonialists had? Absolutely. Christopher Columbus and others. She continues writing, They desire to make our Lord the ruler of the kingdoms of this world. 
the ruler in its courts and camps, its legislative halls, its palaces and marketplaces. They expect him to rule how? Through legal enactments, that's by laws by the way folks, enforced by human authority. Since Christ is not now here in person, they themselves will undertake to act in His stead to execute the laws of His kingdom. The establishment of such a kingdom is what the Jews desired in the days of Christ. They would have received Jesus had He been willing to establish a temporal dominion to enforce what they regarded as the laws of God and to make them the expositors of His will and the agents of His authority. Are you seeing the connection between the ideal in the days of the Jews and the ideals of, say, the religious right and the papacy today? She continues writing, but he said, My kingdom is not of this world. He would not accept the earthly throne. Now, were there abuses under the Roman government? Oh, are you kidding? All kinds of abuses. Why didn't Jesus pick it? They have signs, quit the abuse for a very special reason. Let's continue reading. The government under which Jesus lived was corrupt and oppressive. On every hand were crying abuse, extortion, intolerance, and grinding cruelty. Yet the Savior attempted no civil reforms. You understand what civil reforms means? He attacked no national abuses, nor condemned the national enemies. Wow, that's interesting. Everybody's condemning the national enemies these days. He did not interfere with the authority or administration of those in power. He who was our example kept aloof from earthly governments. You say, well, why? Not because he was indifferent to the woes of men but because the remedy did not lie in merely human and external measures. To be efficient, the cure must reach men individually and must regenerate the heart. The kingdom of God is within you. That's what the church should be preaching. But what is the church preaching today? A prosperity gospel. Psychological self-help. Accumulate as much as you can. God wants you to be rich. And it makes people selfish. She continues writing, Not by the decisions of courts or councils or legislative assemblies, not by the patronage of worldly great men is the kingdom of Christ established, but by the implanting of Christ's nature in humanity through the work of the Holy Spirit. As many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Here is the only power that can work the uplifting of mankind. And the human agency for the accomplishment of this work is the teaching and practicing of the Word of God. You see the contrast between what the Jewish nation wanted in the days of Christ and what Christ wanted? Is that a problem in the United States today? You better believe it is. There's the belief in, in the Christian churches that, that uh, the, the state needs to enforce the beliefs and practices of the church in order for the church to survive because things are getting out of hand. But the way to change society is to implant the principles of Christ's kingdom upon the human heart. And so Jesus refused to fit within the mold of the Jewish nation. He said, I didn't come to take over the reins of civil power. And so they now begin persecuting Jesus, mainly for his violation of the first table of the law. They're going to accuse him of violating the first table of the law. Now, when Jesus resurrected Lazarus, the multitudes began to follow Jesus. In other, words, the, in other words, the churches of the day became empty. And so now the church of that day was losing all kinds of followers and the Jewish leaders became jealous of Jesus. You see, they feared that if this movement continued that uh, their religion would become an non-issue and the Romans would come 
and they would take away their nation, they would destroy their nation. So thinking this, the Jewish Sanhedrin said, we need to call an emergency session. This is a matter of national security. You've never heard that before, right? <laughs> and so they called this meeting of the Sanhedrin to decide what they were going to do with this menace. This individual who had multitudes following him, who was emptying the churches, and people were following him. And so they had this meeting, the meeting of the Sanhedrin. Let's read about it in John 11, verses 47 to 49. John 11, 47 to 49. This is a religious tribunal, by the way. This, is, this doesn't have anything to do with the state. This is the church. This is a church meeting of the leaders of the church, the apostate church of that day. It says, Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered, to get, gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. What, what is their fear? <laughs> They're losing their members, right? And the members are following Jesus. Is that going to happen at the end of time when the loud cry is proclaimed? Multitudes will leave the churches? Is it going to lead to persecution? Yes. Continue saying, If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Is this a matter of national security? You better believe it. They say, this, this is a, a crisis. We've got to do something about this. So they're afraid that the Romans are going to take away their nation. Verse 49, And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. In other words, the solution to this problem is getting rid of the messenger. Ellen White says that our, that argument will be used again. This is, I don't think this is in your in your syllabus. Do you have Great Controversy six fourteen and six fifteen? Yeah, yeah. You got okay. It says there it will be urged that the few who stand in opposition to an institution of the church and a law of the state ought not to be tolerated. It's talking about the Sunday law. That it is better for them to suffer than for whole nations. See, it's not only the nation now; it's all the nations. It's, it's universalized. Then for whole nations to be thrown into confusion and lawlessness. The rulers of the people brought the same argument many centuries ago against Christ. It is expedient for us, said the wily Caiaphas, that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. This argument will appear conclusive. See, it's the same argument that's going to be used. And a decree will finally be issued against those who hallow the Sabbath of the fourth commandment, denouncing them as deserving of the severest punishment and giving the people liberty after a certain time to put them to death. Romanism in the old world and apostate Protestantism in the new will pursue a similar course toward those who honor all the divine precepts. So is this argument going to be used again? The argument that it's necessary for these people to die and not that the nation fall into disarray and perish? Absolutely. And then the Bible tells us that at the end of this meeting, they pronounced, if you read verse 53, they pronounced the death sentence against Jesus that very day. The Sanhedrin, the church did. The church proclaimed the death decree. The state is not involved at this point. This is a religious tribunal. This is a religious entity that, that is accusing Jesus of dividing the nation and, and they say that unless we take care of this problem, uh, the Romans are going to come and destroy our nation. But you know what's interesting is this. They thought that by killing Jesus, they could save the nation from the Romans destroying it. But by killing Jesus, they brought about what they wanted to prevent. Because by killing Jesus, you have national apostasy, and the Romans did come, and they finished off the nation. So they caused what they wanted to prevent by killing Jesus. Is that going to happen also with God's people at the end of time? Absolutely. Now, let's move forward. 
This, by the way, this meeting of the Sanhedrin is taking about, place about six months before the death of Christ. Uh, now let's move forward to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He has gone there, he's agonizing in prayer, he's sweating drops of blood, he's begging his father if it's possible to take the cup of his wrath from his hand. And as Jesus is there in the garden, the, uh, the temple guard, listen, the state still isn't involved here. This is still the church. It's a temple guard. The temple guard comes and they are going to arrest Jesus there in the garden. And you know the story. The Bible tells us that when they came to arrest Jesus, this temple guard, that uh, Peter, who, uh, who supposedly was the first pope, so they say, <laughs> he said, this is an emergency. We need to defend the Messiah. We need to defend His kingdom. And so the Bible says that He took out His sword. Let's read about it in Matthew 26, verses 50 to 52. And suddenly, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out His hand and drew His sword. That's important, His sword. He's going to use force to defend Jesus. Struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Believe me, he was not aiming to cut off his ear. He was aiming to cut off his head, but he missed. <laughs> because he was a fisherman. He wasn't a soldier. <laughs> That's my own speculation. What did Jesus say to Peter? He said, well done, Peter. Way to defend my kingdom. Did Jesus say to the other disciples, come on, you cowards, do the same thing. No. Notice the words that are picked up in Revelation 13, verse 10. That shows that there's a connection between the experience of Jesus and the experience at the end. Notice verse, what it continues saying in verse 52. But Jesus said to him, Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Is that in Revelation chapter 13? He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. So basically what we're finding here is that this, the, the, the action of Peter foreshadows what is going to happen later on with the church in the book of Revelation. Now Jesus was then taken from the garden for a religious inquisition. Do you know what the word inquisition means? It means to inquire. It means to investigate. <coughs> so Jesus is taken to a religious inquisition in the house of Caiaphas. The state still is not involved. The state isn't involved. It's only the church. See, six months before, the church. The temple guard comes to arrest him. The church. Now he's taken to Caiaphas' house. The church, once again. And you'll see that clearly in Matthew 26, verse 57. And those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest. Where? Who was gathered? Where the scribes, the scribes are, are the scholars, they're the theologians, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. Are these religious figures? Any political figures there? No, all religious figures. It's interesting that Jesus was taken to a religious court, in other words. The court of the apostate church that claimed to be God's true church. Now let's read about that inquisition that was made there in the house of Caiaphas. Matthew 26, verses 59 through 64. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the councils sought false testimony against Jesus to put Him to death, but found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last two false witnesses came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. So this is the story of the inquisition that is made uh, there uh, for Jesus in the house of Caiaphas. 
Now it's interesting to notice that every one of the religious laws of the Jewish nation was violated in the case of Christ. It was a great injustice. Let me just share some of the laws that the Jewish nation had that forbade what happened to Jesus uh, during this inquisition. Did they already believe that Jesus was guilty when he was taken there? Was this an impartial trial? No. He was already, already considered to be guilty. They had already made up their minds. Did the Sanhedrin contract with false witnesses? You know, Jewish law forbade the retaining of false witnesses. In fact, the false witnesses were to suffer the same punishment that the, that the prisoner was being accused of receiving. It says uh, uh, also we find that he, Jesus was slapped before he was even found guilty. That was forbidden by Jewish law. His trial was done at night. In Jewish law, trials could not take place at night. They had to take place in the light of day. Furthermore, his trial was in private, whereas Jewish law required that it be made in public. Jesus was accused of violating religious laws, not the civil laws of Rome. You know, Jewish law forbade one witness to incriminate someone, but that was violated in the case of Christ. You know, the prisoner was always given a right, right to counsel, a defender. Jesus was given no defender. Furthermore, it was contrary to Jewish law to have a judicial procedure on Friday, Sabbath, or feast days. And the trial of Jesus was on Friday. Furthermore, if an individual was found guilty, Jewish law required uh, three days to pass before the sentence could be executed. Because in those three days, evidence might, might be discovered that would absolve the accused of guilt. Were all of those laws of the church protecting an individual's rights violated in the case of Jesus Christ? All of them were violated in the case of Christ. Now another interesting detail that we find is that in the days of Christ there were several different sects, or we could call them denominations. You know, you had the Pharisees, you had the Sadducees, you had the Essenes, you had the Zealots, uh, you had many different denominations. They were all Jewish, but, but they, st they had different beliefs. For example, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. In fact, they didn't even believe in the, uh, that, uh, you know, in the second coming. They didn't believe in Christ establishing his kingdom at the end. They believed that when a person died, that was it. That person remained dead forever. On the other hand, the, the, the Pharisees believed in the immortality of the soul. They believed when a person died, uh, their soul would go to what they called the bosom of Abraham. And so the Sadducees and the Pharisees had this rivalry going on. They, they despised each other. The zealots, you know, they were the guerrilla fighters of the days of Christ. They, they didn't much care about theology. They were going to use violence to overthrow the Roman government. So all of these Jewish sects had different beliefs and different priorities, but it, when it came to destroying public enemy number one, they all came together. They, there was an ecumenical movement, if you please, among all of those groups. Notice Matthew chapter 26 and verse 66. At the end of this uh, meeting in the home of Caiaphas, this inquisition, if you please, it says, Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look, now you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, He is deserving of what? He is deserving of death. Who pronounced the death decree against Jesus? Was it the church or was it the state? It was the church. At this point, the state isn't involved at all. Six months before, it's the Sanhedrin. In the garden, it's the temple guard that comes to arrest him. The inquisition that is done in Caiaphas' house is the church. It is the church that is orchestrating this against Jesus. But the church had a problem. And that is that the church could pronounce the death decree, but it could not execute it. And so now the church needs the help of whom? Of the civil power. Let's go to Matthew chapter 27, verses 1 and 2. Matthew 27, verses 1 and 2. It says, When morning came, all the chief priests 
and elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. Who are the ones that want him to die? Uh, the, the political leaders? No, the chief priests and the elders. It continues saying, and when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him. Now the state is going to become involved. And they delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Who's involved now? It's the church appealing to the power of the state. Let's notice uh, chapter 18 and verse 30. Chapter 18, verse 30. Now Jesus is brought. Pilate comes out. And Pilate uh, asks the, Jew, the Jewish leaders a very penetrating question. In John chapter 18, verse 30, Pilate then went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? In other words, what are the charges against this man? Now, they could tell by the tone of Pilate's voice that he was not going to believe much of what they were going to say. And so their answer doesn't really square with the question. Notice the answer that they give in the same verse. It says, if he were not an evil, they haven't even listed any evil deeds that Jesus had done. If he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Are you catching the picture? So does Pilate see through them? He, Pilate could see through them. He says, well, what accusation do you bring against this man? They say, oh, you know, this, this, and this, and this. Is, if he wasn't an evildoer, we wouldn't have brought him to you. So then Pilate says something very interesting. Do you know Pilate had uh, clearer in his mind the idea of the separation of church and state than the Jews? Notice what we find in John chapter 18 and verse 31. Then Pilate said to them, You take him and judge him according to your law. How many laws did Pilate recognize? Two. Two. He says, I got my law, and he hasn't violated any of my laws. You know, you haven't presented any, any accusations that he's abused his parents or killed anybody or committed adultery or stolen or, or you know, born false witness against, against a certain individual. You haven't brought any of those accusations against him. So according to my law, he's not, he's not guilty. So he says, take him and judge him according to the church law. Because, you know, I can destroy this temple and build it in three days. What does that have to do with, with Pilate? He said that he was God. Pilate says, that's not my religion. He broke the Sabbath, so what? All are religious accusations. And so he says to them, you go and judge him according to your law. Oh, but they're not satisfied. Notice what we find there in verse 31. Therefore the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. Whose help does the apostate church need? It needs the help of the state. Because the church can pronounce the death decree, find somebody worthy of death, but the church cannot execute the death penalty. They need the help of the civil power. Are you starting to catch an interesting picture? here? Let me ask you, who is the dangerous figure in this story? Is it the church or is it the state? It's the church, it's the church that's dangerous, the apostate church that wants the death of Christ. So they say it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. And soon they realize that if they continue this line of reasoning, Pilate is not going to condemn Jesus. He, they have to find some accusation where Jesus did something against Rome. And so they have to openly lie, blatantly lie. Notice Luke 23 and verse 2. Luke 23 and verse 2. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation. Lie number one. And forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar. Woo! Bold place lied, because Jesus had said, Get, render to Caesar what is Caesar's. He said, pay taxes. And then, number three, saying that he himself is Christ, a what? 
Christ a king. And when they say that Jesus claimed to be a king, oh, suddenly Pilate is paying attention. He says, now, no, 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 you know, he's perverting the nation, saying not to pay back taxes to Caesar. I don't believe that. But if he says he's a king, that's sedition against the Roman government. That would be a crime against Rome. So what he does is he calls Jesus into his private chambers to ask Jesus whether he's a king. Notice John chapter 18 and verse 36. John chapter 18 and verse 36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. How many kingdoms did Jesus recognize? Two. The kingdom of this world and his kingdom. The kingdom of this world is Caesar's kingdom, the state. The church is the kingdom of Christ. Incidentally, Jesus called his church the kingdom. He said, upon this rock I will build my church and I will give you the keys of the kingdom. So the church is his kingdom. So he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, what would his servants do? Like Peter, right? <laughs> my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now, my kingdom is not from here. So then Pilate says, well, are you a king then? Verse 37, Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So after Pilate has this private interview with Christ, he says, this man isn't guilty. He's not claiming to take the place of the emperor. He said, this, his kingdom is out of this world. Rome has nothing to worry about. <laughs> and so three times now Pilate goes out and he declares that Jesus is not guilty. This is significant. Three times he says Jesus is not guilty. Notice verse 38 of John 18. Pilate said to him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. John 19 verse 4. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Once again in verse 6. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Had Jesus violated any of the uh, principles of the second table of the law? Had he violated any civil law of Rome? None. Pilate says, not guilty when it comes to the civil law of Rome. Now, if he, he dealt, if he, he did, did some things that are contrary to the church, well, that's your issue. It's not mine. Judge him according to your law. Are you following me? Now, I want you to notice John 19 and verse 7. Very significant verse. The Jews answered him, We have a law. <laughs> so, how many laws are we talking about here? <laughs> Civil law and what? Church. And church law. Is that clear? Yeah. We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die. Pilate says, Not according to mine. So according to whose law must he die? Is this going to happen again? This is a wonderful way of studying end time events. You know, usually we study end time events from Daniel and Revelation, Matthew 24, you know, and so on. But the, I believe that one of the best ways of studying end time events and all the issues is looking at Christ's end time events. Because this story is going to be repeated again, just like we're studying it. So the Jews answered him, we have a law, and according to our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. And I'm sure Pilate is thinking, so what does that have to do with me? What does that have to do with Rome, with the civil power? How does that corrupt society? Incidentally, this argument that we have a law, 
is going to be used again. Notice uh, signs of the times, May 26, oh, I forgot to put the, the year, but anyway, it's in signs of the times. Ellen White wrote, those who live during the last days of this earth's history will know what it means to be persecuted for the truth's sake. In the courts, of in the, in the courts injustice will prevail. The judges will refuse to listen to the reasons of those who are loyal to the commandments of God because they know the arguments in favor of the fourth commandment are unanswerable. They will say, we have a law, and by our law he ought to die. Same argument, right? God's law is nothing to them. Our law with them is supreme. Those who respect this human law will be favored. But those who will not bow to the idle Sabbath and have no favors shown to them. Now let me ask you this. Does the church have a legitimate place in the plan of God? Yes. Does the state have a legitimate place? Who established the state? God did. Who established the church? God did. Notice John 19 verse 11 where it's made very clear that God established the civil government of Rome. John 19 verse 11 says Jesus answered because Pilate says don't you know I have the power to release you if I want? And Jesus says to him you could have no power at all against me unless, unless it had been given you from above. So why was Pilate uh, ru ruling in civil matters? He received his authority from where? From above. Did the church also have uh, an order from God to rule in religious affairs? Absolutely. And then Jesus says, Therefore the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Now the big question is this. Why would Pilate condemn to death an individual who three times he proclaimed not guilty? for two reasons, and we'll summarize those, and when we come back for our next session, we will uh, amplify these points. Number one, because a tumult was brewing. There was going to be a riot. And Pilate says the most expedient thing is to prevent the riot by delivering the innocent man. But secondly, to save his political skin. Because they said, if, if, you, if you don't condemn this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Caesar's going to remove, remove you from your political position. Visit secretsunsealed.org for annual class dates and topics. Anchor is a seminary level course of study on the fundamentals of Seventh day Adventist theology taught by Pastor Stephen Bohr and guest theologians. Seating is limited.